That it's sort of a little odd for, it to be that, for us to be that nostalgic about it, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, the, to this concert. So coming to the stage now, we have two people who have been extraordinarily influential uh, across everything happening in digital marketing for a long time and in different ways. Um, Guy Kawasaki first came to our notice as the head of the evangelist for Apple. Uh, he is uh, author of multitudinous books. Um, uh, Enchantment is the most recent, although actually he has one on Google+, Plus, which I have not yet read, but I've read uh, many of the others, and they're always hugely provocative and informing and, and also fun. Uh, he's also the, the presence, the gray eminence behind all top, uh, which is attempting to, to slice things onto the, uh, the, the top layer of everything that you really want on the web. Uh, Robert Scoble is the startup liaison for Rackspace. Uh, he's also one of our most formidable bloggers uh, and video bloggers, and uh, first came to our notice uh, when he was one of the very first people to be blogging from within a big organization when he was at Microsoft. And so these are two guys who, uh, they're very current, they're, they're very busy, and yet they also have a longitudinal perspective on the industry, which I think we'll all find fascinating. They're here in conversation with each other today uh, on advertising in the social sphere, deciphering ways to create connections, engagement, and presence. Let's give a big hand for Guy Kawasaki and Robert Scoble. Come on out. All right, take it away. What's up, Guy? So, Robert, thank you very much for having us here. Yeah. Um, AdTech is one of my favorite conferences because it's all marketing people, and I love marketing people, so uh, it's, it's a target-rich environment. So, <laughs> you want to be the guest or you want to be the host? We can switch roles. <laughs> people in the audience, we'd love to get you involved, too. All right. So, uh, what should we talk about first? How about our favorite topic, Google Plus? What about it? I don't know. Is anybody there? Well, yeah, right. <laughs> I am. That's two of us. So what, what's your current opinion of what's going on there, how it's going? I think Google is in a deep hole uh, with comparison to Facebook. And uh, you can see that hole in a, whole, in a, in a bunch of different areas. For instance, uh, app developers. They keep telling well, me. That's they, an oxymoron. <laughs> Google well, Plus, but, yeah. Google Plus doesn't have a right API yet. So uh, where Facebook has this open graph API where apps like RunKeeper, when you go running, can report mm -hmm. into Facebook that you're running. And Google doesn't have anything like this. Uh, it doesn't have a way for Spotify to share the music with your friends and so on and so forth. That leads to a whole range of things that is keeping Google at bay, right? Uh, we're, we're using this app called Highlight at, at South by Southwest. How many I'm of you are it, using Highlight? Probably like five people, right? because I already stopped you guys. <laughs> For those who don't know what Highlight is, it's this app that uses Facebook, so it requires Facebook, and it shows um, people who are also on Highlight and who are within 100 yards of us. So there's you know, all 15 of you on my phone right now. Um, this is, but this is pretty cool. This, this is informing about where the puck is going to me. To me, it's a predictor of what kinds of apps we're going to see in the future, thanks to mobile, thanks to tablets, mm -hmm. thanks to the systems that Facebook has built, right? They, uh, Highlight can't build on top of Google+. Plus. There's no right so, API to do this. And, there's, and there's, no, there's not enough people in the world who are on Google+, Plus who have added all their likes. I've added 1,000 likes on a Facebook, right? Google doesn't know that about me. It knows other things about me, mm -hmm. but it doesn't know my likes. It doesn't have a good friend graph, right? My, my, my wife's family who, who grew up in, in Iran, and all of her elementary school children from the 1970s are all on Facebook. They're not on Google+. And until that happens, it's, this comparison of Google+, to Facebook is, is going to be just like this. It's, people are going to go, it's a ghost town, or it's not up to date, it's not there. Uh, Facebook is still the disruptor against Google, and, and so on and so forth. Don't look at me like I'm going to defend Google+. <laughs> Last time I checked, that didn't work for Google. Uh, but I, I have to tell you that you know, I still am very enamored with it. I, I like the aesthetics. I especially love the fact that I can edit. Yeah. I edit almost every post and every comment. And so what I do now is I post first to Google+, I read it, I like it, and then I copy it and paste it to Facebook, yeah. so, which is kind of an awkward uh, Procedure. I mean, we have Google Plus right here. Yeah. Um, 
But what do you think? Okay, so someday, so I, someday there will be an API, right? I, I don't want to be all negative on Google Plus. The conversations I have there are really better than Facebook for some reason. Maybe because we've all the conversationalists have self-selected and gone to Google Plus, <laughs> uh, and we've found a place because it's new and it's more public. It has an affordance of being public. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way that Facebook really didn't. Facebook started with just friends and family, right. and people are struggling to understand that Facebook can be public now. Maybe because of that, I'm getting conversations that are interesting. And if Google continues going down the collaborative route, I think it'll be very powerful. The, the video Hangouts, you know, at where I work at Rackspace, we use it to uh, com communicate between our two offices because we have uh, dev teams that are decentralized, mm -hmm. right? And you can have eight people chatting back and forth on video. That's something you can't do with Skype, and it's, it's something you can't do with uh, Facebook yet. And if Google keeps rolling out features like that, I think they'll be just fine. And if they continue uh, putting my content into their search engine, I think they'll be just <laughs> fine too. Which is for for this audience is yeah. why you should still be investing in. Well, so Google that's Plus. that's a very good question. So you know, having heard your your issues with Google Plus in terms of the lack of API and 900 million people less, what should these marketing people do? Should they just take a wait and see attitude? Should they get their fan page going? I mean, what, what's the advice for them? I would build a brand that goes across all the social networks. I wouldn't just invest in Twitter. I wouldn't just invest in Facebook. I wouldn't just invest in Google Plus. What I'm doing, if you watch my Google Plus, it links over to my Facebook, and my Facebook links over to Twitter, and my mm -hmm. Twitter. And I, and I bounce my audience back around all three, which makes that audience have um, much deeper uh, resonance. And <laughs> you hope. No, it does. And, and by the way, that, that uh, continues a weather pattern that brings startups to me and, and so, other things. So something I wonder about you is that I have more followers on Pinterest than you do. Yeah, well, way. that's a temporary. How many of you are on Pinterest? <laughs> How many of you are on Pinterest? We all follow me and not him. So <laughs> I can catch up because it really affects my ego and my whole <laughs> sense of well-being that Robert has twice as many followers on Pinterest as I do. Um, so you you think you think they should have multiple presences? Yeah. In all three, and and yet you know they're they're sort of resource and time constrained. So how would you stack rank them? Twitter, Facebook, and Google Plus today. It depends on who you are. I mean, if Let's you're, a, you're a if Virgin you're a, America, if you're a wedding dress manufacturer, okay. Pinterest is where you should be okay. building relationships with that with the influencers okay. who are hanging. What if you're Virgin there. America? Uh, Facebook, okay. but Twitter, Facebook, um, Facebook is is driving more traffic to these brands. You know, I talked to GoPro last night, and I talked to yeah. lots of brands. Um, and it, it, does that match? This audience knows where the audience, where the, which one, who would say put most of your effort on Facebook? Twitter? Do nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Super Bowl commercials. YouTube? <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. So it's most. We're having trouble getting an engagement here. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> if, if the two of us can't do it, we might as well go home, man. Wow. So uh, most of you recommend Facebook as a marketing platform over Twitter and Google Plus? Yeah? That's fair. For, for you. Well, for, let's say for big brand, Facebook. What about, a, as, you know, to take the opposite extreme, what about this wedding dress uh, designer? Then what? Pinterest. Pinterest, yeah. What about a restaurant? What about you know, a street food vendor who wants to say that, my, my truck will be at the corner of uh, Yelp. Twitter and Yelp. Yelp and, and food spotting. My brother owns a bar. I'm getting him to support these newer things where foodies are hanging out looking for food. So, I mean, it seems like, like it's a very confusing time for everyone, right? I mean, what do you do anymore? Um, I, 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 not, not that I've done this scientifically or with any kind of feedback mechanism or anything. Um, I focus everything, almost all my effort on Google+. Plus. I just, it, it, it may not be right, uh, but it's just... I did for a while because I... It's falling in love. Well, I did for a while because I knew that whenever something is new, that's when the uh, uh, social graphs, the graphs get built, mm -hmm. the linking behaviors all get built, and the perception gets built. Okay. 
And now I, I'm still there every day, every morning and every evening, um, but I'm putting less effort into that and spreading out my effort back into Pinterest. This is probably why I'm well, picking well, your speaking, ass on Pinterest. Speaking of effort, Robert, so like I look at Building 43 and I look at Scovalizer, yep. there's not a lot of action there anymore. So where's vlogging in your mind these days? I, I'm focused on the social network because I, I see that's where the traffic was coming from anyways. And I don't have to deal with the brand that, um, you know, a, a media brand has to deal with. A media brand has to get you to leave Facebook so that they can monetize you, so they can show you ads, the stuff that you guys do. Right. I don't have to worry about that. And I, so I've decided to live inside the Death Stars. I call these things the Death Stars or ecosystems, right? Um, and by doing that, you can build a very sizable audience very quickly. I mean, I, on Google+, Plus, I have more than a million followers. You have a mo more than a million followers there. On Facebook, in just the last four months, I, I've gone from 13,000 followers to 175,000 followers. This is followers. when you cut over to subscribers, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So you, you consolidated your fan pages into one profile? I did, because I don't have to worry about Right. building a brand page that's a brand. You know, I'm, I, I'm Robert Scoble everywhere, so I don't I, have to worry about that. I, I had the same you know, situation where I had a, a personal profile and two fan pages, and I just could not maintain it. It's just too hard to be in three places, plus Google+, plus, plus Twitter, and now Pinterest. So it's, it was killing me. Let's talk about the, the brands that are doing it right. You know, talk about GoPro. How many people have watched a GoPro video in the last month or so? Yeah, you know, uh, some of their videos have been watched, I don't know, 20 million times. Um, why does that work? Why does the Red Bull, the, the guy who runs Red Bull here, is here, by the way. I saw him on the highlight. Yeah. Why does that work? They have 500 people building media that causes conversations, that causes ideas to happen about your, their brand. And why does that work? Well, um, my, my theory is that you know, all of social media it comes down to is your product or service good, and in the, at the point but, of but Red Bull is arguable. It's arguable, right? It's sugar water I with don't know, caffeine. But there's better sugar water than other sugar water. I mean, it, if you go, if I took you back ten years and took you in a time machine, took you back before Red Bull had built that brand, you would have spit it out. You would have said, "Man, well, give me my Diet Coke back. This stuff tastes like crap." Right? Where's the Red Bull? I, guy? I did this, right? <laughs> yeah, let's get the Red Bull guy up here. <laughs> But now we think it's a, it, a must-have. How did he do that? He did that by attaching his brand to people who jump out of planes and surf 60-foot waves and but it do is, extreme. There's, a, there's a, a case of Red Bull in the TechCrunch office. Why are they doing that? They're attaching their brand probably, to other bleeding-edge, early adopter, innovative brands and people. Well, why is it in TechCrunch then? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have one in your house? I mean, Red Bull. I bet they'll deliver one in your house. You know, I have to tell you a funny story. The other night, um, my six-year-old downed a can of a similar drink, and wow, did we pay the price. I mean, he, like my older son said, oh, yeah, go you know, try this. And it's like pure caffeine. And he was up all night. It was an ugly situation. Uh, so, so but, but, you know, I would make the case that with GoPro, it is a very cool camera. So contrast, you know, what happened, what's, but they're, what's they're, the difference between GoPro and Contour then? Their, their competitor Contour actually is easier to use and has All right, so why is one that, taking off and? Because of, of this brand that they built. And they hired, by the way, one of the first eight employees from uh, Red Bull. So they said, oh, the Red Bull sold sugar water using this new thing. Uh, we can use that to sell $300, $300 cameras, they right? should They should hire John Scully because he made a, you know, he has a history of selling sugar water. <laughs> he went to Apple. So, so, so now GoPro has 10 guys down here who go around the world and do media. Next week, they're going to be up in Alaska shooting uh, school teachers who are going to let weather balloons up in the air. And they're going to put $300 GoPro cameras on those things and make media about this. The media causes us to talk. And on sure. Google Plus now, I have something new in the morning to put on my Google Plus page and on Facebook and on YouTube. I can like it on YouTube, right? I can so, Twitter about it, tweet about it. Where, where do you think GoPro would be today if, it were, if social media didn't exist? Well, they, they would be forced to buy Super Bowl ads. Right. And? And they'd still do. They, they actually, Nick, the guy who runs uh, GoPro, said, we, we bought uh, ad space on Oprah. So they went straight for the, uh, the market. Oprah? Oprah. I kept seeing their ads on Oprah, and he said, 
Yes. You because watch Oprah? I do. <laughs> Why? She's number one. So what? I want to study. I want to study innovators. Why? How did they get to be number one? God, I learned something. I hope you all tweeted that out. That Robert Scovel is an Oprah I, fan. Actually, yeah. when I was on Fox News, I met Winona backstage. Yeah. And I said, I saw you on Oprah. <laughs> and she said the same thing. She said, you watch Oprah? <laughs> and I said, only when you're on. And then they, that made lifelong friendship there. Your, um, your whole metrosexualness is coming out there, Scoble. I mean. It's San Francisco, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, they bought Oprah TV commercials because they wanted to demonstrate that this $300 camera could stand up on a big screen TV. And they, they bought other spots on other shows as well. But, um, they, they would have done just fine, I think, but they would have had to work and pay a lot more to get where they are. This, uh, this social media is the, the free advertising. This is why your book is so interesting, right? Because companies that create remarkable products get talked about. How did Instagram, this, you know, Instagram started down here on the pier with right. two kids at a picnic table that cost $500 a month? That's where Occupy SF is now. Pretty much now. <laughs> yeah. Two kids, right? How did they get to 30 million users without doing any advertising? Without, they built something that caused conversations in the social media space, okay. and they took off. So, so you think one of the key marketing messages today is to cause conversations in social media? Cause conversations, period. Period. I mean, I, you know, Apple, I, I was sitting next, behind two people on the, on the plane one year when the, the iPod first came out with that white headphones. Why did Steve Jobs do white headphones? Why not red ones or black ones? Black ones actually look better because they don't, they don't look so glaring. Yeah. But white ones cause conversations. I saw, I saw this happen. Well, Somebody said, what the hell are those white headphones? I've never seen white headphones you know, the, before. The question for that is And then the device came out, and that, that started that conversation. If we could truly go back in history and find out if white earbuds was on purpose or not. I mean, I understand looking back, it's definitely a principle of social proof. You know, the more white earbuds you saw, the more likely you were buying an iPod, the more likely you bought an iPod, you added to the pool of white earbuds. So it became this wonderful upward spiral. But, you know, was it on purpose? That's not, it doesn't matter. I guess it doesn't matter how you succeed, if you succeed, right? Um, I'd say uh, if a product causes conversations, positive conversations, not negative ones, because, like, I have lots of companies that I bitch about all the time on Twitter and don't get served well. And, don't build a product that, mm -hmm. that's uh, nice, but positive conversations cause free advertising. So, so maybe, f you know, and by the way, when you get free advertising, when you do paid advertising, yeah, it works better. better. Yeah. So, so, you know, other than the duhism that you should cause conversations, could you give your theories about what are the qualities of a product or service that, in fact, do cause conversations? Um, it's hard to tell. It's something emotional when I, so I go around the world and I study startups, right? I, I saw Insta, I was user 77 on Instagram, mm -hmm. it's past 30 million today. Uh, I saw Flipboard before anybody else did and I, I immediately had um, an emotional response to it. I said, that is cool, I want that. And I don't know how to describe it. You describe it in your book, but I, you know. So for you it's like pornography, you just know it when you see it? That's it. You know, when you have a great meal, you know, you go to Guy Savoie in Paris and you, and you have a great meal. There's a bit of social proof going on there. Everybody's telling you you're going to have the best meal of your life, and then you do. You know, but how do I, decide, how, how do I describe how to make but, a, the best meal you've ever had? But, I can't describe but for it this, to you. For this session to be of any use to the audience, and we have to give them more than, you know, create stuff that people talk about. I mean, we've got to give them something more actionable than that. Because, like... Nobody's out there saying, oh, I was going to create this piece of shit that nobody's going to talk about. I mean, <laughs> so, so what, what do they do? I mean, they're wondering. There, if you're creating a product, there's a few, a few ways to get PR and get people to try it. Okay. One, you've got to be there at the market window when the, when, when the window is open. Instagram would, only would have happened within a four-month period. Why? Because that's when iPhone was taking off. That's when the camera was... Uh, the camera quality was taking off and getting much better. That's when the social graphs were taking off and we were building our social graphs out so, and understanding what Facebook was really all about. So you don't this believe- This is where we wanted to share something with our Facebook and our Twitter friends. You don't believe that products like Instagram create their own windows? 
Um, no, I think they fit into the windows that are there. The good entrepreneurs know how to hit those windows perfectly. A uh, flipboard would have only happened that summer. If it happened a year later, it wouldn't have taken off. It, it, it just would, it, somebody else would have satisfied the demand. There was four competitors to Flipboard and still are pretty good ones, like Pulse and um, Zeit and, so, and mm -hmm. some other mm -hmm. si services. Zeit got bought by CNN, right? So, and they all came out within the same per time period. GoWall and Foursquare came out at the same time period. Foursquare just had a better uh, philosophy. Um, I couldn't check in at Buy Right ice cream store down the street, right, with GoWalla, because he made a choice that he thought the game was more important than the check-in, than the, than the data you're going to learn about when you check in, you know, and, and uh, Dennis at Foursquare understood that it wasn't the game, it was the data that you were going to get when you checked in that was going to keep you using the app and make it, make it useful, right? Okay. So these, these these market windows open up because new devices, new ideas, new things happen in our society. You know, a Apple's Macintosh opened up desktop publishing, right? And there was PageMaker and a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. PageMaker is the one we remember because it won. Well, but there were other guys who tried to make that happen, but, right? But just so you know, you know, because uh, I was there. I know you were there. Desktop publishing was a gift from God to Apple. It's not like Apple said, oh, let's create a Macintosh because we have this vision of people wanting to do their own publishing. We wanted to make it a spreadsheet database and word processing machine, and basically we were zero for three. And, you know, if you, if you ever want proof that there is a God, it's Apple computer because, I mean, that's the only explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of a benevolent God. Well, what got Steve... <laughs> what? What got Steve to ship a $5,000 printer? Because that's really what caused that, that market window to open well, up. Well, it was $7,000, but um, it, it was Steve's... Steve, I, don't, I, I think my interpretation is Steve just could not stand the fact that he created a computer which integrated text and graphics tied to a letter quality daisy wheel printer. That just was such oxymoron for him that he had to... And he started out with a dot matrix printer, but, you know, that wasn't good enough for Steve. And so, you know, where else do you go? Xerox Park? <laughs> Figure out what they're doing, you know? You democratize it. Um, that's a good path. I mean, you know? How did he convince everybody to do that? Because that's the tough thing for innovators. How did he convince you know? internal people? Yeah. Well, $7,000 printer, man. Give me a break. Well, <laughs> Who's going to buy that? I, I hope <laughs> you don't think that Steve had to convince anybody of anything. Back in the 80s, he was not Steve Jobs. I mean, he was still Steve Jobs. Okay. Uh, yeah, but he wasn't, you know, the Steve uh, Jobs of today. Believe me, he was. Um, he, uh, that's not a democracy. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have, like, he didn't have off-sites with employees and ask them how, he, how they felt. Let's just say. <laughs> okay, I mean, <laughs> he never asked me how I felt. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have told him anyway, but no, that, I, I think you have to attribute Apple to his just sort of single-mindedness focus on whatever he wanted. And he was just right. Uh, so he was right, and he opened up this market window that all this page maker jumped into. No. No. Oh, okay. In a sense, he was right about creating the hardware, you know, the Macintosh experience. But all this page maker opened up a market called desktop publishing for right. Apple. But if it wasn't for that laser printer, right. I would never have bought a Macintosh. That's true. I, and because I was in the journalism world back then, I would never have bought a Macintosh. I would never have That's switched my allegiances from DOS to a Mac, you know, the Mac world. And our school wouldn't have invested the money to buy them for the journalism department, right? Yep, yep. So PageMaker took advantage of this market window that opened up. This is what entrepreneurs do so well. They see something happen. If you talk to Paul Davison, the guy who created Highlight, you talk to him, and he goes, yeah, this is a market window that's opening up right now. This is why there's seven competitors to highlight. There's Sonar, there's Bot, uh, Glancy, and Banjo, and on and on. There's, there's a bunch of them. Why? Because a lot of us now have iPhones or Android devices that have GPS, that have cameras, that have mm -hmm. uh, ability, always on wire, Wi-Fi. Remember when Twitter first got hot at South by Southwest? AT&T didn't stay up, right? Now AT&T stays up. <laughs> and that opened up opportunities for guys like, like this who come along and say, I could do something with this Facebook thing that didn't exist six years ago. I can do something with this GPS that we didn't have these six years ago. 
And so, now there's a market window that's open up. Now, in two years, that's going to seem commonplace. And, and if somebody wants to build a highlight, they're, they're not going to be able to. It's too late. It's too late. So for this audience, you know, from, from their perspective, what do they do? What do they do when they see a, you know, five different location-based services, five more, you know, Groupon clones, and they're, and they're running these large brands, and they're trying to figure out, you know, well, the, do I Well, the head of Al Jazeera, I had breakfast with him through Highlight. He's on it. Yeah. The head of uh, Red Bull, he's on it. Yeah. And so, the head of Adidas, he's right. on it. Yeah, but, I've collected but 20, how are they supposed to know this? By coming here. To this, this, to is this why, session? This is why you pay five grand to come to ad tech and hear some new ideas. Is that right? I hope so, because <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm going to go out and hang out with all you guys and, and ask what's new in your industry. And what, that's why I'm here, to learn new things and see where the puck is going. You know, Because the Google guys, I was standing with a friend of mine at CES, and Sergey Brin walked up. Yeah. And he was wearing a helmet with a, a, a camera and with a, a LED display in it. Yeah. And he w was looking very dorky. Yeah, and? Sergey Brin came up and started asking 50 questions about that. Google's wa working on wearable glasses. The Israeli companies, face.com, they have face detection. You aim it at your face, and it tells me I'm looking at G Guy Kawasaki. Highlight is informing me about a new app that shows me who's around me and soon what's around me, right? What's cool right now? What's buzzing? Where's the cool party tonight? We're already able to sense that from Foursquare, right? But it's not. So it's, you, you take that to where the puck is going two years from. Robert, I understand. We're going to have these Google glasses. Now you down, Robert. I mean, you know, <laughs> arguably, these people pay five grand to come to this conference, not to hear that you should go where the puck was going, because prior to coming to this conference, they were going to the puck, where the puck was. You know, so like we, people, my we dad gotta is help still them more struggling. Tactically. We have to help. These them. are innovators, so they want to know where the where it's going. My dad is still struggling with how, how Facebook works, right? This audience, I hope, knows what a social graph is and knows what open graph is and knows how things okay. get. I'm going to push you in another there. direction because it's impossible to get you in this one. Um, <laughs> from the outside looking in, viewing the efforts of larger brands yep. in social media, what do you think they're doing wrong? Um, not responding to what's, you know, what's being said about them. You know, we bitch about United Airlines every single day on, uh, on Twitter. And do they respond, do they shift their company to listen to that feedback? Not uh, really. And so you mean respond? We still don't have Wi-Fi in any of the planes that I fly on, right? Well, we well New we York still San Francisco have, has. We still have, yeah, because they were forced to by the innovator, Virgin, Virgin American. Yeah. And they were getting their ass kicked on the really profitable route from New York to San Francisco, and so they were forced to there. On the non-profitable routes out of San Francisco, they are not forced to, and they have crappy planes with crappy seats and no Wi-Fi. I, <laughs> now I at least put Wi-Fi. Anybody here from United? While we're, <laughs> I bet you won't raise your hand now, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, not learning from the Red Bulls and the GoPros of how to create conversations about your, your product and your brand. The, the world is now a YouTube world. It, you know, are, are companies creating enough media that people want to engage with? And are they figuring that out? Not many companies are. I mean, I, I, you know, I, at Microsoft, I, I got to 4 million views a month using a $200 camera and just going around the campus and interviewing people. Mm -hmm. How many companies are even doing that? And that was seven years ago. Let's ask. How many companies are doing that? And how many companies take a little camera around and interview the cool people at your work? A couple. How many, how many of you produce Fewer video at all? Fewer hands than are on Highlight, by the way. That's a, yeah. And what kind of video do you produce? Yep. No, for, for your company. How many of you have companies that produce yeah. video? Stuff from, from your iPhone that interests you. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. You know, we have, a, we have the ability to do live video from here. How many people are doing that? We have a TV studio here. This is shit we, we had to pay millions of dollars before. Yeah, a few years ago. Before, <laughs> 10 years ago. I mean, I, you know, I worked at TV stations you know, back in the 80s. And this, this stuff is magic. Um, anyways. Well, you know, to answer my own question, you know, from the outside looking in, <laughs> Um, I adore something like Virgin America, where if you look at their Twitter stream, it's not simply about Virgin America. Yeah. I mean, they provide tech support, they provide 
you know, information about destinations that have nothing to do with the airline per se. And, and they also provide information and promotions for Virgin America. I think it's a very nice mix. And uh, so I, I subscribe to what I call the NPR model. And the NPR model works like this. So 365 days a year, NPR puts out great content. And so they provide such great content that I think they've earned the right to run the telethons. I can't tell you I enjoy the telethons, but in my mind, you know, I, I want to support them because they have done such great content. And I think that's a very good model for most brands. If you're producing great content, then people won't mind if you then promote to them every once in a while. And so I, I would, that's sort of my mental framework for my social media activities also. Because I post a lot of content, but I figure 5% of my content is truly promoting my book, my brand, my whatever yeah. um, that has financial return. But I keep in mind, it has to be roughly 20 to 1. I mean, I, I, I'm listening. I'm, I'm listening to anybody who tweets the word ad tech right now. So if you want to say we're uh, screwing up on stage or <laughs> should talk about something else or, or if you're questions. scared of asking a question, you can do this, right? This is how companies work. I, I visited Dell uh, a couple weeks ago, and they have a whole room where they have huge monitors, and they're studying everything that's being said about them and their competitors, and they respond to it. They've totally changed their, uh, how people think of Dell in the, in the social media. Okay, so let's, let's explore the opposite question, or the opposite example, which is Apple. Apple is the anti-social company, right? It's closed, it's opaque, it doesn't engage other than in the Apple Store. Apple Store, I'd say, is as great as it gets. But digitally, socially, social media, yeah. Apple's zero. There's one Apple in the world. Most of us are an Apple. Granted, but... And, and Apple has uh, this band of evangelists that you help build that answer all the questions. But imagine if, imagine if one day Apple... They're very come. adept at dealing with that band of, of evangelists, by the way. You know, M.G. Siegler or Gruber, they get invited to meet with Apple. Yeah. I'm sure if M.G. has a problem with a Mac or a cu I've customer been, has a problem and he's hearing about it, he gets like, a backdoor. You know, to Apple's defense, I think any customer who has a problem with a Mac gets treated well. But still, imagine if Apple ever decided to embrace social media, how powerful it would be. They tried with Ping, so they stuck their toe uh, in the water. I mean, but I don't mean, I don't mean offering a social media service. Okay. I mean to actively participate, to engage. It would screw up their model, though. Why? Uh, their model is uh, the brand speaks for the brand, and it's similar to Target. If you go and talk to Target, the brand speaks for the brand, the employees don't speak for the brand. And that's a tough one to change midstream, um, and it works for them. It works for Target, too. The CEO at Target very rarely gives interviews and very rarely is seen on stage at conferences talking about the brand. About the brand. They want your experience to be the brand. I mean, John Fry at Fry's Electronics told me the same thing. He, the reason he doesn't want you to take pictures in the stores, because they have a no camera policy, is so that you discover the store by a friend dragging you in there. Right? That's a very powerful uh, way to discover something, and it's, it's much, it, it creates much higher loyalty and much better brand uh, resonance, brand um, so you're saying engagement, I guess. That Apple is not something to learn from in social media? Um, I would learn from it and choose your own path. You know, use what, you, what uh, gifts God has given you, you know? Um, don't, <laughs> don't try to be an Apple or a Microsoft, because you, you'll fail at it both, because they have uh, things that you can't, that you don't have, right? I, uh, you know, when I did Channel 9 at Microsoft, I had 70,000 employees who were doing cool stuff to go around and study with my little mm -hmm. camera. I interviewed 600 employees, everyone from the janitor to Bill Gates, right? That doesn't happen at a lot of companies. You know, at Red Bull, there's not a lot of cool technology there. You know, once you see the, how the line runs, that's it. There's one, <laughs> there's one video there. Uh, so you have to go and come up with a new plan for your own company that causes conversations to happen about your company. You gotta use what God gives you, not, not what Apple has or not what okay. Microsoft has okay. or Google or Facebook. So I guess the takeaway is trust in God. <laughs> and I'm an atheist, so there you go. <laughs> God well, being fate. So we, we, you want to take some questions from the audience now? I'm taking them here on Twitter. OK, yeah. so do you, uh, you can step yeah, up to the look. mic. We'll take questions from the audience. Um, 
Somebody said this is the best discussion you've heard in years. You don't get out much, do you? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Hi, Guy. It's Colleen Shell. How Hi. are you? Fine, thank you. How are it's you, good Colleen? Good to see you again. Um, I am wondering, a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about, of course, has been talked about a lot through the years in customer engagement and how you actually create customer engagement. And we talk about the brands Red Bull and, you know, GoPro and, of course, Apple. And it's like the same brands are talked over and over again. And if you look at those brands, those are some sexy brands. You know, they're doing sexy things. They can sp talk about sports drinks and, you know, beautiful photography. But I'm just wondering, what is actually getting in the way from brands taking this customer engagement to an innovative level and really like playing with their brand, playing with their customers and creating those videos, creating the conversations that make an impact? And a lot of people, just one more point, a lot of people like point to these out, you know, outside circumstances like, oh, we don't have the budget or my boss won't tell me, you know, let me do it. But is there something that we're doing ourselves that are getting in our own way for us succeeding in customer engagement? You, you just nailed it. The fear of trying to do something new in big companies, uh, you know, at Microsoft, we were, uh, we were lucky. Um, the first day we were, we, the PR team tried to shut us down. And, but we were lucky because we had 100,000 views that first day and we were in the New York Times and so they couldn't shut us down. But they, they did have this reaction, what the hell is going on here? Somebody's <laughs> going around Microsoft with a $200 camera taking t three, 30 minute videos and putting them up, you know, without checking with PR and doing all, I mean, we broke a lot of, that was just one of the rules, this site, this site Channel 9, if you, if you go to it, broke a lot of rules seven, seven years ago. It didn't have a Microsoft logo on it. It put customers on the homepage and the customers could say Microsoft sucks right on the top of the homepage live, you know? This broke all sorts of rules. There was, we, we explicitly chose a color that the Microsoft branding police didn't like. You know, we were, we were poking a lot of <laughs> things Did in the Did you get belly. fired from Microsoft eventually? No, you, you know what? They tried to hire me back this week again. Really? <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know? What was the sign Because they're, they're in trouble. They have 2% market share for their mobile phone because developers aren't supporting their mobile phone. It's that high? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Khalid, to answer your question, I would say that it, it, it's a more succinct way of describing what Robert said, which is I think people ask permission too much. Yeah. They should just do. I mean, it's easy for Robert and I to say that, but I think that, you know, if... But beware of the, cult, the culture at each company. Yeah. You know, the work I was doing at Microsoft was shoving on this, I call it a corporate membrane. Some people say there's a line in the sand. There's not a line, it's a membrane. And at some companies, it stretches a long way <laughs> and it snaps back like this. Yeah. At Google, uh, a guy left Microsoft and um, went there and was blogging the same way I was and he got fired in two weeks. He didn't understand that Google, they were just about to go IPO and, get, and everybody was about to get rich. And he started shoving on this membrane and it was very taut. So you have to be a really good listener to the internal politics and understand who you're going to piss off. When You've got to play chess you know, inside a big company. Um, that said, you know, try to do something. Here's something that big companies never do. Try to do something that pleases four people. Four people? Just four people. Any four people? Any four people. Try to do something that pleases four people. Because if you figure that out, then make it eight. Then make it 16. If you double a penny every day for a month, you end up with five and a half million dollars at, at the end of the month. You're still deep. But this is, what we, this is how blogging built. This is how Twitter built, right? It took Twitter six months to get 13,000 users. Today, right. we expect that in the first day or <laughs> a couple hours. Right. You know? But it took Twitter six months to get to 13,000 users, and I was like 13,500, so I wasn't even that early, and right? I, I came in six months after it was out. And I started pitching it, you know, then, and people would tell me it's the lamest thing they've ever seen. And they're doing that with Highlight, by the way. People are giving me hell about Highlight. <laughs> they're going, what the, what the hell are you talking about Highlight? It seems like a niche, uh, Sabrina says. At, at how many users does it really become relevant? Hey, next question. No, no, this is a great <laughs> question. This is why innovation doesn't happen in big companies. Why? But because they can't get small things. Oh. They can't get why you would do something to please only four people. OK. The numbers aren't there. I, you know, Steven Sanofsky wrote me an email this long one time with the words business value 13 times. 
because he was running a $4 billion a year business. And I was telling him to go buy Flickr and go buy you. <laughs> I told him to buy uh, Skype before, they, yeah. before eBay did for $2 billion. They eventually did buy it, but it cost $8 billion, right? Yeah, yeah. OK. Hello. Yeah. This is Edgardo Flores I'm from Honduras. Um, I have a, a question for you. It's a, it seems that one of the biggest challenges today is keeping up to date with technology for people who work in the digital content. So uh, how do you balance your time between keynotes, traveling, family, <laughs> business, and uh, hockey? <laughs> um, Balance? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, would you sign my book at the end? My enchanted book. Balance? Uh, Hold it up, yeah. Let, um, me, let me show you my family. You can't really see this, but it's my two kids reading iPads on Sunday morning. <laughs> and of course, I'm reading my iPad. That's, that's family balance in my family. So, um, <laughs> you know, I... <sighs> the secret to my success in life is that I'm willing to grind it out. I don't consider myself particularly smart or visionary or insightful or everything. I'm just willing to grind it out. So I just work hard. That's, that's what I do. I don't, you know. And I love to write. Um, I get great peace of mind writing. Uh, you may not believe this, but I am very introverted. This public role you see is thrust upon me. Um, I think that actually explains why I like social media so much, is because I can pick my interactions at the time and place and method that I want. Um, I also, physically, I have uh, something called Meniere's disease, and there's three symptoms of Meniere's disease, which is, ver this is going to be a little TMI, a little HIPAA violation here. Uh, Meniere's disease has three symptoms, hearing loss, tinnitus, which is a ringing in this ear, and attacks of vertigo. And so a large group like this or a cocktail reception or a party where everybody's moving and grooving and shucking and jiving, with tinnitus, it's very difficult to hear. So it's almost painful for me to go to these events. Whereas sitting at home alone in the dark, you know, on Google Plus, <laughs> with my 1.6 million followers, 600,000 more than Scoble, um, <laughs> that's my element. I just feel at home there. It's the secret to my success. <laughs> yes. Guys, is this yeah. on? Yeah, just keep talking. Okay. Uh, first of all, my apologies, Robert. You were right about highlight. I get it now. I'm using it. That's Francine, by the yeah. way. Um, here's the question for me. We keep urging the brands to get social, get social. What if the customers really don't want to engage that much with the brands? The only time a customer really wants to engage with a brand is probably when they have a problem. Uh, I disagree. That's one reason. The other reason is to tell everybody how damn cool this iPad is. Oh, <laughs> oh it's just Apple. I mean, Apple's the only one. No, no it's not the not only true. one. I, I go to you know, a race, and I see Red Bull, and I tweet that out. I mean, again, you create experiences in life that can be Instagrammed, can be tweeted, can be Foursquared, can be. We, we want to tell other people about things that are I mean, magical to us. You could, you could make the case that you should go to the engineering department or the R&D department and say to them, you need to give us a product that will generate conversation. And if your product suck, you know, we can't put lipstick, oh, we, we could put lipstick on a pig, but if you give us a pig, it's still a pig. And so, you know, yes, Apple is an easy example. Um, and it certainly doesn't foster social media because it doesn't participate in social media. But even something like you know, Ford, right? So I love Shelby Mustangs. I love Shelby Mustangs. So I, I post pictures of it. I mean, I, I posted a picture that had a picture of a Ford Mustang, and it said, you know, warning, causes pregnancy, okay? <laughs> and to put it mildly, I took a little heat for putting that up. But, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it's because a Shelby Mustang is so cool. So the test for product development is, are you creating something cool enough where people like Robert and I, who have no particular financial interest, no nothing. You're paid by Samsung now. Oh, uh, yeah, but I'm not talking about Samsung. I'm talking about Ford right now. Right. So, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a very good test for are you creating something cool enough that it generates social media conversation? If you're not, you know, boo on you. I mean. Yeah. So, guys, we've got time for these two gentlemen who have been very patient. And okay, awesome. Off.
Let's, uh, let's actually start with that gentleman there because okay. he's been waiting longer. Yeah, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, my name's Phil Hirsch and I'm um, from Northern California. Hello and thank you for a great talk. This is about entrepreneurs and you were talking earlier about finding the window and all that. I just, it's kind of like devil's advocate. I don't think entrepreneurs are creative in that way. I think entrepreneurs have this single, the Steve Jobs, you know, single minded, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. And the ones who happen to hit a window or something, you know, and then everyone goes asks, you know, Sergey and Larry, how'd you do it? They just yeah. happened to be at Stanford in 1992, <laughs> you know? All right. So to tell people find the greatest, best product is kind of like I'm being devil's advocate. I want to hear what you think. Entrepreneurs are kind of, uh, what's that word? Idiot savants. They're dumbasses in some ways. It's like, this is what I want to build. This is what I want to build. And some of them succeed and the vast majority won't. That's so, true. Your thoughts. That's true. And, uh, you know, we have a success bias. We talk about the ones that were successful. All right. Because we want to attach our brands to the cool brands that, that have been there. Um, the good entrepreneurs find something that, that works for four people. I mean, I, Steve Jobs and Woz, Wozniak told me they built a computer for 200 people and they didn't want to build a company. He said, I kept trying to get my bosses at, 18, at Atari, Atari and, and HP, HP to yep. build this thing for 200 people. And they wouldn't because big companies don't understand how to serve 200 people or four. You you know, know. I, I agree with you. I mean, to a large degree, entrepreneurship is the law of big numbers. And you know, the more people out there trying stuff, the more likely you'll get a success. But then you know, I think the it's people we talk about are I'd, only the success. I'd rather have a doubling. Uh, if I'm an entrepreneur, I'd rather have doubling, doubling. not big numbers. Start with four people, and if it turns to eight, no, no, no. 16, I mean, then... big numbers is there has to be lots of entrepreneurs to get one oh. YouTube, one Facebook, one Cisco, one Apple, and, but you never hear about the ninety-nine point nine percent that fail. That's yeah. true. Um, and, and in the venture capital business, you know, you you say, oh yeah, you know, we funded Google. I knew Larry and Sergey were going to be a great team. They had a great algorithm. They had a great business model. And if you ask them, well, why would you also fund Webvan and 19 other losers? You say, well, my partners did those. I told them not to. <laughs> <laughs> That's how venture capital works. <laughs> we got one more question. Tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Roland Smart. I'm from a San Francisco-based company called Involver. Yeah. And I have to say that I'm pretty surprised that the conversation on stage today has not talked more about open graph and particularly about custom verbs, custom actions. You mentioned that entrepreneurs step into open opportunities, right? Yeah. I see this as probably one of the biggest open opportunities out there. Yeah. And I think it's particularly relevant for people in this audience because we've seen integrations for applications like Spotify, which are these sort of evergreen experiences. Yep. We haven't seen it much yet for campaign-based experiences, though I would point everybody to the recent USA Today ad meter as a really good example of how it was used for a campaign. I'm just curious to hear what you guys think, because for I, me, this is one of the biggest opportunities out there. I'm just surprised you haven't uh, talked about it more. I, I talked with the Washington Post uh, talked with Yahoo, talked with uh, Food Spotting, our friends of mine. They're all seeing numbers that are going crazy because of, the, of this Open Graph. So I'm sure there's some people here don't don't know what Open Graph is. I don't. But it's an API. It's a it's a way to talk to Facebook through these verbs. So when I go running with RunKeeper, it kicks off an event, a verb that says Robert Scoble ran 6.3 miles in tw to 20 years. 20 years or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or food spotting, you know, Francine ate sushi, liked sushi, mm -hmm. nommed it, right? Nommed is one of their verbs. So every company has their own verbs for their own actions that their users are taking, and that shoves in. And you see those verbs on the ticker on the right side uh, of Facebook if you use a, a standard old computer instead of a, an iPad. And you see these verbs roll down. So you see somebody listen to a song, to Skrillex on Spotify, somebody nom something on food spotting, somebody you know, mm -hmm. played a Zynga game. Those are the verbs that talk to the databases in, inside so, uh, Facebook. So just they, go ahead. Put that in terms of, of ads, right? I mean, if you're buying ads, think about it this way. In the USA Today example is a good one. You buy ads to drive people to the experience. Yeah. When right. they're there, they do things like watch videos or rate them. That drives content into the ticker and then drives more traffic to the experience. So right. if you think about 
you, you drive 100 people there with ads. If you can get another 20 people for free yeah. to engage with that content, that's a tremendous value to an advertiser. So I think that's one of the biggest opportunities. Absolutely think about that for the next few months because uh, I think Facebook's gonna do an open graph style of advertising uh, of its own. And let me set up why. So open, why does Mark Zuckerberg need to know everything about us? Needs to know our sexual preference, needs to know our politics. <laughs> he needs to know whether we're male, female, how old we are. It's, it's partly to serve this audience, right, to give demographics. But he's building a new media company, one where the media comes to you, and Google's trying to compete with this, right, with Google+. The media comes to you based on who you are. So if I know everything about you, Guy Kawasaki, and I know you're a hockey fan, I'll bring you some hockey content, right? And Facebook is collecting that data about who I am through the open graph. It isn't yet serving ads back out to these ads, to these apps. Like food spotting doesn't get any value back yet. And I, I keep hearing rumors that Facebook's working on a new ad model, sort of like Google brought to the world, where they're gonna shove ads back to the player, back to the Spotify, back to the food spotting. And when they do that, they are gonna clean up because Google has not, uh, not opened up its API yet and has not built this identity system that Zuckerberg has. There's a reason this company's worth $100 billion, and it's certainly one that you guys are all gonna be affected by in the next 18 months. Well, I wanna build on that for one moment, because tomorrow we have uh, Paul Adams from Facebook, yeah. and we have Joe Turo from uh, the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania talking about some of these very issues, and Joe's book, The Daily You, really does dive into that, as does uh, Eli Pariser's book, The Internet Bubble, so, or The Filter Bubble. People who don't know who Paul Adams is, he wrote the paper at Google that became Google+, and then he moved to Facebook because he realized Facebook was way ahead in terms of social and understanding social. Uh, he uses an example, and he'll probably show it off tomorrow, of the Etsy gift store. Have you, have you ever gone to that, gone to Etsy, and clicked, uh, you know, show me gifts, the potential gifts? It hooks up to Facebook brings in your Facebook friends' likes and suggests gifts to, it, to you. It's magical. That's the kind of social thinking that's, that Facebook is doing because they have this identity information and they're gathering more every single day. Uh, and that, that's locking it's Google. Powerful, yeah. It's powerful and it's locking Google. And Google doesn't have an answer to this yet. We expect to hear one in June at the Google I.O. conference. Google's conference sold out in two minutes, by the way. So it sold out a 10,000 person conference in two minutes because our industry is interested in, is Google gonna have an answer to this open graph? Well, speaking of conferences, I do want to point out, Guy, uh, you, you, you can get into ad tech for way less than $5,000. You can bring friends <laughs> for that much money. No, but it, you, you said 5,000. Most people have to fly to conferences and stay in a hotel. It's, it costs $5,000 about to go to a conference like this. So. That, that pains me to hear because it's just, they're, they're, you, it's much more economical than that. But you can go look to adtech.com and find out for yourself. Let's give these gentlemen a big right, round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. So, thanks for having me. So, I, one piece of bad news, which is that uh, Mr. Kawasaki is uh, heading to Dallas and there are hurricanes, and so he's actually, tornadoes? It's gonna be locusts and plagues by the time he gets to the airport. We, we are, we're gonna have to have him skip the book signing. However, he did uh, stop by and pre-sign a great number of books for Enchantment, if you wish one. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Go, uh, go to the conference. We have an expo pass, uh, hall, a break for an hour. Con conference sessions start up again at 3.45, and don't forget to come to the concert and the beer, the beer pub. The pub crawl, pardon me. <laughs>